Hello, this is David Sprinkle, the Research Director for Package Facts. I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today on innovation with grains. Um, a special welcome to our own Package Facts clients and to our Food Industry Knowledge Center subscribers. And also to guests from several trade organizations and publications, including um, several from the Whole Grains Council. Welcome to you all. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before the main presentation. The session will be freely available after the event. Um, registrants will automatically get an email in a day or two with the downloading information, so you can watch for that. Also, we will be having a question and answer session after the main presentation. I'd like to encourage you all to send in any questions throughout the session as they come up so that we can get those questions lined up and collated to tackle afterward. A summary of Karen Nielsen's professional experience was included with the um, webinar registration, so I'll let her culinary expertise speak for itself. But I would like to add a more personal note that I've worked with Kara for many years, dating back to her role as the managing editor of the former culinary trim epic reports, which were published by Package Facts and by the CCD, or Center for Culinary Development, in San Francisco. From that working relationship, I know that Kara's work is always informative and insightful and last but not least appetizing and craveability incurring. So I just wanted to warn that for those of you who might not have had lunch yet. But it is from that tradition of collabor collaborating on culinary trend tracking that I'm especially pleased to turn things over to you, Kara, for the main presentation. Thank you, David. It's my pleasure to be here today talking about grains, and I hope I am enticing everyone with this delicious photo of the bread rack at the mill in San Francisco. And if you haven't had a chance to go there, put it on your trend tour list. Our presentation today will start off with a quick overview of the state of the grain world, and then we're going to focus on four trend topics, looking at nutritious grains, traditional and ancient grain expansion, snacking on grain, and going against the grain. And these are the areas where we're seeing a lot of innovation and energy in the new product development space. I'm also adding a slide of some of the products that I saw yesterday at the Fancy Food Show in New York, which is where I'm broadcasting from. And then we'll finish with some strategic inspirations and then tackle your questions. The state of the grain world is something that is really, it's always with us. Um, grain is such a foundational part of the American diet and our global society. But what has changed is that consumers are now really looking for higher quality foods, foods that are less processed than they were in the past. And grains are really speaking to this, and, and that is part of one of the big reasons that grains are changing and products like bread, and the cereals, crackers, baked goods are responding to this consumer demand. Consumers are also and ever in continually interested in nutrition, uh, even in indulgent products, that nutrition is always top of mind. And since this nutrition and healthfulness continues to be a main concern for consumers, we're seeing a new variety of grain products really responding to that as well, as well as a host of product claims on labels of packaged foods. Considering this, we know that consumers have some mixed feelings about grains, and we're all aware of both the gluten-free trend, the new grain-free trend, and as well as the excitement about some of these natural grain and whole grain products. So we really have a whole spectrum of interest and excitement around new grain products, recognizing that on both sides of with grain and without grain, there's a lot of consumer energy and action. Yet considering how foundational grains are, whether it's in bread, pasta, pizza dough, uh, tortilla wraps, um, we know that this is always going to be something that's important to solve for, and it's important to listen to what, where sort of this market is going and continually look to innovate and upgrade. And we're going to be looking at some of the areas where we're seeing the most innovation and I have to say, it's a really exciting grain world. Even though it can be a totally mainstream item, we're still seeing a lot of news. Just as a quick foundation here, the types of grains that we're really talking about, a lot of the grains that are in the wheat family 
uh, as well as some of the grasses, uh, barley, millet, rye, sorghum, taff, wild rice are kind of in that side. But what's exciting too is that consumers are learning more about different kinds of wheat. And it's not just generic wheat, but understanding some of the older kinds of wheat and uh, different styles of wheat. And then there's also the cereals that are also part of this the bigger grain bucket. Now these are the same on the right hand side of the screen. The Whole Grain Council talks about ancient grains or grains that are considered left unchanged for several hundred years. So they're more in their pre-industrial and pre-food industry state. And a little, there's still a lot of varieties there and what's exciting now is seeing these come up and find a place in the marketplace. And then I've also listed some of the gluten-free grains. Many of them are considered ancient grains, like the amaranth, the quinoa, millet, but some of them are very familiar corn, oats, rice. Our first trend looks at how different products are really trying to leverage the nutrition needs and interests of consumers today. And what's really neat is even though, like I said, whole grains are a very familiar item and it's something that we know about, we see it as a recommendation from the dietary guidelines that government puts out. We know that some of the real uh, nutrition interests that consumers have are being answered in part by grains. So when we think about the consumer drivers around health, which is both about controlling your health and any kind of health condition, and then wellness, more on the proactive, trying to improve your health side. Um, these are two very big drivers today, but also integrity. And the integrity comes on the side of ingredient transparency, understanding the sources of where some of our ingredients come from, whether they're organic or non-GMO. These are all parts of what people consider the nutrition story behind a product. 100% whole grains are also having a new uh, life, certainly coming from more of the, the bakery and the smaller scale size side, yet consumers are really recognizing that all of that good nutrition that's stored in the grain of wheat or any of these other grasses and cereals contains a ton of nutrition and people are now really waking up to some of that that's still in the ancient grains uh, and still in these 100% whole grains and are looking for new sources to get all of that bran, the vitamins and minerals, uh, all of that good energy that's in 100% whole grain. We're also continue to see headlines and news stories talk about how beneficial whole grains are. And this is whole grains, not just any grain, but whole grains are to our diet. And just this month, uh, Harvard Public Health came out with yet another study in line with US dietary guidelines that talks about the reduced risk of premature death due to whole grain consumption. We also see a lot of consumer movements in the general nutrition area around the interest in whole foods, the interest in artisan and crafted food items, small batch items, and then all the various different shades of wellness movements. These, many of them, have a, grain, a place for grains to play. And so because of this, we're really seeing a lot of new ways that grain are coming onto the marketplace. And then what's really exciting too is because grains are something people really understand, the health claims that they offer and that we see on the packages are really quite believable and are considered valuable. One of the biggest health trends that we're seeing right now and, and product claims is around protein and then also fiber. So as consumers continue to look for protein, whether it's in a whey fortified beverage or whether it's in um, a plant-based item, what's exciting is that whole grains really meet some of this in ways that we might have even forgotten. So when consumers are looking for satiety, when they're looking for energy and vitality, when they're thinking about good digestion and even preventing diseases, whole grains really have a role to play and a number of brands are doing an excellent job of leveraging that message and offering products in sort of a refreshed way, whether it's on the natural channel or the conventional channel. This is also in line with the greater interest in plant-based protein. So for those who are looking for plant-based, whether it's for dietary reasons, monetary reasons, or part of interests and values around sustainability, grains really fit in here. And I think we're going to be seeing that the protein trend is going to evolve into a fiber trend as we understand more about our digestion. And so grains are very well placed to answer both of those needs. One of the biggest exciting stories when you're talking about breakout brands, Dave's Killer Bread, uh, wonderful backstory, but a really terrific product. Um, just 
chock full of seeds and grains. Um, really a great example of one product that really urged other traditional bread companies to catch up and respond. And so we see Pepperidge Farms coming out with very recently with their harvest blends. We also see Bimbo Bakery uh, and a variety of brands in that company offering up an extra grainy bread product in an effort to compete with the Dave's Killer Bread promise. We also continue to see snack bars touting more of these protein-rich grains. Um, of course, there's all kinds of snack bar action, including meat bars and um, uh, different kinds of grain-free bars. But we continue to see things like this Curate Snacks. This is a new brand from the Abbott Nutritionals Group touting the quinoa and oats in, in these bars, um, sort of in the style of a kind bar, for example, but actually something kind of new and really looking at calling out the quinoa and the oats. Kind itself also has a whole health grain line, uh, including a number of puff snacks that have recently been released to the market. One of the trends that I've been very excited about and also have been tracking for a number of years is that of sprouted grains. And for consumers and um, practitioners interested in traditional ways of making food, sprouted is one of the first things that they turn to, whether it's um, sprouting your rice before you heat it in your rice cooker or sprouting grain in the manner of uh, a long fermented bread dough or sour bread dough. This is something more and more people interested in whole foods and good nutrition are really recognizing is a really easy thing to do that also releases a lot of the terrific nutrients that are in grain to make them more accessible by our body and it also makes these grains easier to digest. For those people who are eating a gluten-free diet, sprouted is also an option and for some people it does allow for easier digestion of wheat grains that do have gluten. So you can imagine that there's definitely a lot of interest here. Um, we're seeing sales, while they may not be absolutely gangbuster at 250, um, they're definitely on track to hit that by 2018 according to New Nutrition Business. Um, this is definitely something that's coming in the natural space and is really showing some nice growth. We see that uh, Nielsen Scantract has noted that uh, the product category has grown close to 13% between 2011 and 2014. And I know I've seen a lot of new sprouted products, so I know um, this is surely increasing. What was also encouraging is the Natural Marketing Institute surveyed consumers in America and 17% of them understand what sprouted really is. I think that's coming from all of our multicultural consumers who perhaps have grown up in a household where sprouting is something that uh, takes place, whether it's the sprouting of corn um, for tortilla making or the sprouting of rice uh, in Asian American households. But this is something that's um, pretty well understood and I think uh, larger companies should really take advantage of this uh, and continue that education and continue exploring ways to add more sprouted grains. We Better Snacks was really a brand that got out in the forefront of this. Uh, they continue to expand their line of tortilla chips. They now have crackers. Uh, and I think they've done a really good job of basically taking this sprouted out of the sort of old health food store model, kind of represented by the Foods of Life brand, and taking it into something very contemporary and consumer friendly. And now we're even seeing uh, baking leaders like King Arthur Flour introducing an organic sprouted wheat flour for baking enthusiasts. So you really see that this is spreading kind of across the supermarket and to a variety of different consumers. Here's a handful of some new sprouted products. Uh, there's always something new, but what's exciting is to see this go somewhat mainstream. Taking a look at that 7-Eleven Go Smart snack. Now, I'm wondering if this is something that Way Better Snacks uh, is co-producing for 7-Eleven, but I think uh, this is a really great uh, example of how easy it is to put a really good claim and a really good product. You see this is also a non-GMO project verified product. It also has the whole grain council, whole grain stamp on it, uh, but it's being positioned as an easy snack at 7-Eleven. It's just such an easy thing to do to me. It just uh, I'm really excited to see some of these products come out. Angelic Bakehouse recently has put 
one of its breads in Costco, the Sprouted Seven Grain Bread. This also is a bread that, and a bread line that uses a lot of uh, different types of wheats as well as some ancient grains like quinoa, amaranth, barley, and millet. And you can see the protein and the fiber is reasonable. It's not um, overinflated, but it definitely underscores that there's still a lot of other benefits here as well. I think one of the most interesting uses of sprouted grain is in this cheeseburger by the new brand called Local. This is a new fast food chain that is starting in California by two celebrity chefs, Roy Choi from Los Angeles and Daniel Patterson from the San Francisco Bay Area, and they've gotten together to create a very affordable, accessible, uh, and somewhat healthful fast food chain. There's two of them open now. I ate at one last week. Uh, and I've eaten the burger, you would never know that there are sprouted grains added to this burger to not only extend the product, to add nutrition, but also to reduce the amount of beef in the burger. Um, additionally, there's mushroom and um, tofu in the burger to really, again, uh, take a different look at how we're feeding people. Another way that we're really seeing grains play to the nutrition side is the certain grains that are being touted as super grains. Consumers continually love the superfood idea. Mintel reports that superfood launches have been up 36% in 2015, and the United States is definitely a leader in that. Some of the ways where we're seeing these superfoods and super grains um, are also really point to the future of some of the smaller folks who are really trying to make a difference, like the group of UC Berkeley students, grad students, and postdoc who have founded the Millet Project. And this group is experimenting with growing different kinds of millet in California in a, with a goal of adding both diversity to diets as well as agriculture. Uh, it's this kind of grassroots effort kind of coming from the millennial generation and even the Gen Z generation that are very, show a very committed population that would respond to products that are using these types of grains in an effort to promote diversity. We also see more purple. Pur this is the year of the purple products. Um, everybody knows that blueberries and blackberries are good for you, but we're starting to see some of the purple grains be antioxidant heroes in certain new foods. Here's back to the roots with their stone ground flakes made from purple corn. And we also, uh, recently there was a, an article made its way around the internet from uh, a professor in Singapore University talking about how to enrich bread in a way to make it uh, have a lower glycemic index and slow sort of our, our metabolism's response to bread. And he did it by adding the pigments from black rice or the same anthocyanins that we see in all these purple foods into bread. And you see the picture there of these purple rolls that look kind of cosmic, uh, but it's a really neat idea when we're talking about how many people want to have bread and how, hard, how easy it is for our body to digest it too quickly. So adding something to slow it down is really interesting. And you also see here this ready pack superfood grain are superfood salads that now have power grains, things like wheat berries and quinoa as part of a green salad. We're also seeing a lot of traditional and ancient grains. Basically, it, this is a, a return and a revisiting of all of those whole grains that we've always known about as we see ancient grains make it all the way to the mainstream space, appearing in products like Cheerios, now right behind it on the tail are different kinds of wheats and grasses also turning up in different places along the trend spectrum. So on the left here you see uh, this is uh, the pastry chef and chef at Vetri in Philadelphia. This is a restaurant that now is milling grain in house and converting all of its pasta recipes and bread doughs uh, to this locally milled flour. We also see grain salads being shown, exhibited both in grocery store deli cases and recipes. And then we see companies like Kashi tapping into some of these very historical wheats uh, to obviously demonstrate that this is sort of a new kind of granola here with the cocoa, coconut granola with kamut, which is the branded name for a chorus in wheat grown in the United States. Here's some other products where we're seeing some of these ancient grains, so both the wheats and some of the other grasses and cereals in different kinds of products. 
Some of these brands, like Jovial, has roots in Italy, where uh, some of these grains have uh, always been around and they haven't really disappeared, but now they're being imported into the United States. This is a brand that also has a lot of cereals and cookies, but seeing this einkorn being uh, proudly uh, advertised on the front of this pack, and look at the protein there at nine grams of protein. We're also seeing rye have a place. This, these are Effie's homemade rye crakes. It's a cracker to go with cheese, sort of seeing rye in a new place. And this is a new product from Kashi here using teff, which is a gluten-free grain from Ethiopia, in a, a pretty forward-thinking flavored uh, cracker that's going to be coming out to the market soon. And here's that extra grainy bread I mentioned earlier with uh, all kinds of different ancient grains as well as seeds. Another way we're really seeing grains tell a new story is the different kinds of grains that are being used in different places in our diet and in convenience products. With Patagonia Provisions is an instant soup that the idea, I guess, is to take it on your camping trip, but I'm sure it works in your kitchen just fine. This is an instant soup mix with a base of buckwheat, barley, bulgur, and quinoa, really uh, uh, lending a lot of protein and fiber to that vegetable soup. And then we're also seeing new convenient side dishes, whether it is a frozen item like the Cuisine Adventures. These are uh, frozen, individually wrapped grain sides. Or the grainful steel cut sides. These are made with steel cut oats. Uh, and as you can see here, this is a pouch, a report pouch um, with four servings of grain. I tasted these at the um, Expo West and they were enhanced with different vegetables or even something like andouille sausage to make it more of a center of the plate item. And it was very satisfying in a really neat, unique way of bringing grains into the center of the plate. This is also a very big and beloved millennial food item, and that is the bowl. And whether it's the salad bowl, the soup bowl, or the grain bowl, millennials just love their bowls to the point that the Wall Street Journal is reporting that the sales of bowls has increased over the sales of plates when we're talking about dishware. This is something we're really seeing in the food service side. Uh, as you can imagine, chefs, as you see here on the left, chefs go savory in LA. Certainly the influence of multicultural chefs and Asian American chefs bringing in the historical tradition of the rice congee and using it as a base for a variety of mushrooms, herbs, uh, pickled, slow roasted eggs. Um, that's certainly on the savory side. We're also seeing some morning porridges with different kinds of savory and sweet ingredients and using oats in different ways. Uh, here in the center, Bon Appetit magazine talked about this perfect lunch bowl that was made up of a really hearty rice and grain blend topped with different vegetables and greens. And then a new eatery that's just opening up from the Protein Bar. This is a chain of formerly kind of quinoa-based smoothies and wraps. They're now expanding and introducing a new brand called Thrive 360 Eatery with a, a wider variety of options, including a farro salad bowl topped with chicken and avocado. And of course, that breakfast grain uh, continues to be something that whether people are eating it in the morning or eating it all day long, we're certainly seeing a lot of energy. Um, I have been very impressed with the number of cereal cups, grain cups, both sweet and savory, that have been introduced in the last six months um, in both the natural and conventional space. So we're seeing a new day for any kind of cereal cup. Here you see one from Purely Elizabeth with ancient grains and puffs. Uh, we're also seeing muesli, which is the Swiss, a Swiss style of eating oatmeal, kind of soaking it overnight with apples and other kinds of fruit. And here you see one from the Chia Pod folks that's uh, plumped up with coconut milk. Um, also different kinds of natural cereals and cereal bars. Uh, but we're also seeing this in the restaurant space, especially in the ho hotel and cafe space, where every different um, hotel or cafe has a signature porridge or a signature granola bowl or cereal bowl. There's a new restaurant in New York called Coco and Crew. This is for, coming from Australia, and they have a variety of grain items, including buckwheat hotcakes, a granola, and a lunch grain bowl. 
On the baking side, what we're also seeing is that these grains are really being recognized not only for perhaps being gluten-free or really nutritious, but for actually having flavor. And I think this is really going to change the baking space. Coming from different bakeries and pastry chefs, getting excited about the flavor of all these different flours and playing with them in a way to really add dimension to our baked goods. We're seeing pastry chefs in LA, New York, Chicago, uh, London, play around with rye, with buckwheat, with teff, and some of the other ancient grains, and really having a good time um, publishing cookbooks and selling these items. Rye is one of the uh, grains that we're seeing more in things like brownies and chocolate chip cookies to really add a lot more dimension and make things a lot less simple. Another thing that we're seeing in the grain space, and this is a big topic in and of itself, uh, is this new grain economy. And just as we've seen all of this local produce being sold at farmer's market, we're also now starting to see more farmers trying to return to a pre-industrial moment when grain was grown throughout the United States in smaller a smaller scale production. And so in California and Washington, where grain grows readily, and even places like North Carolina and New York, where it's a little bit tricky, we see farmers starting to grow grain again, in part because there are bakers, brewers, uh, different kinds of users who are looking for more variety, more flavor, and more nutrition. They really are moving on beyond um, this kind of industrial commodity wheat and trying to do something a little bit different. This again is in line with the consumer drivers, not only around sustainability, because this very much is an agricultural movement, but also around nutrition, around flavor and variety, around authenticity, and returning to all that great nutrition we lost. There's a lot of folks really involved with this, whether it's researchers at the Bread Lab and Washington State University. There's a number of different conferences and meetings. There's projects uh, centered around farmers markets, like the Regional Grain Project in New York. There's a number of different books written about this, and there'll soon be a documentary coming out. So this movement has been going on now for a good 10, 8 years, but it's really picking up pace. And what it's leading to is a new variety of specialty grains on the market, whether they're coming from grain farmers like the Bluebird folks up in Washington who are growing and packaging and selling direct to consumer these variety of grains and you even see waffle mix here. Uh, Valley Malt is a company in Massachusetts. These were home brewers who got really excited about getting different kinds of grains that they could then malt and add to their beer. And so now they took it upon themselves to uh, also not only grow some grain, but also get different kinds of grains and malt them and then sell those to breweries, some of the craft brewers that you're seeing in New England. And on the West Coast, Community Grains, started by a restaurateur in Oakland, uh, is another company that's trying to uh, talk with farmers, talk with consumers, and then even make a packaged product uh, using some of these grains. They've recently are now selling uh, their flour and whole foods in the Bay Area as well. And the millers, again, this is a story, uh, I've seen a lot of numbers of, you know, historically there were hundreds of mills across this country and uh, now we're starting to see some of these come back to life to support the milling of some of these grains. Carolina Ground is doing um, a great business and really connected to a lot of restaurateurs, bakers, pizza makers. We're also seeing uh, Camus Country Mill up in Oregon growing some very interesting wheats and then sending those grains and um, wheats to other places. And Grist and Toll is a really interesting mill in LA that talks about being one of the only urban flour mills. They're based in Pasadena. It's the first mill in 100 years in LA and they have a nice variety of different California and West Coast grown grains. I know they are um, milling the Edison flour that's being grown up in Oregon. And so it just is a whole little chain. Here are some of the folks that are having fun and playing and experimenting with some of these grains. Uh, Brooklyn Bread Lab, uh, which is part of a kind of hotel complex, and they have a stone mill in the bakery. We see distillers, uh, this Hudson Whiskey uh, happening uh, up in the Hudson Valley in New York, as well as Sagamore Spirit Rye in Baltimore, a little closer to Package Facts. 
in Chicago, Baker Miller, a, a couple, they used to have a pie shop and then they got excited about the milling opportunities and now have a mill and a restaurant that serves all different types of foods based on what they can mill in the restaurant. And here's also its pizza, David Bauer, connected to the North Carolina mill, making some awesome pizza as well as different kinds of bread products. I include these even though I recognize, you know, this is very small scale, but this is what some of these consumers who are really interested in artisan foods, local foods, really understanding their sources are getting interested in. I can easily see a mill, a grade mill, going into almost any supermarket and um, being used to sell grain that way. I can also see different kinds of specialty products using these types of grains. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here to really tap into this growing trend and to support it. And here's La Brea Bakery already doing that. They've come out this year with a new set of breads based on wheat with a purpose. These are breads made with a single origin heirloom wheat that are grown in Montana. Definitely have a premium price, but they're also a really cool premium product. And they have three types of bread that they're doing at the moment featuring emmer, wheat, spelt, rye, and cracked wheat berries. We also see that grains have found their way to the snack space. And since snacking is such a major way that we are taking our meals these days, it's really important to look how grains have really enabled a new style of snack foods. One of the most interesting are all the ways that grains can provide mini meals and better for you snacking opportunities. Um, because we, uh, as Americans, are eating all the time, we are looking for things that feel more like a meal or feel more nutritious. And we see a lot of these instant grain cups or mini meals or salad meals based with grain. Uh, here's the savory one, for example, in counterpoint to the breakfast ones we talked about earlier. What's really good about using grains in this snack place is they're offering exactly the nutrients people are looking for, the protein, the fiber, but also a savory side. So these aren't only just sweet snacks or salty snacks, but you can really just do a lot more and make it feel a lot more like a meal. The forms that we're seeing here, of course, the cups, the bars, but lots of crisps, sort of bread, skinny baked bread slices that uh, probably are made to go with crackers, but also feel a little bit more like you're eating something substantial. Uh, some of the cookie thins and bars are also really interesting. I've seen some quinoa cups. There's a, a I Love Snacking is a small brand that has quinoa cups that are coming from South America, and they're 100 calorie cups in different types of flavors featuring different vegetables, and it's a quick little quinoa snack. We're also seeing these bars like Mediterra doing a savory bar. Mediterra uses amaranth and also puffed peas. Uh, Kashi itself has a new line of savory bars that features oats, quinoa, millet, sorghum, and some extra bean powder for protein. We're also seeing how grain-based items are adding news to the snack aisle and really um, creating a lot of fun here. So here we have from the Vintage Italia. They started with a pasta chip and very savory flavors, but now they've moved on to these cute bow ties with even more fun flavors. And these are crackers or different kinds of pastas that are then fried, uh, but it really is something a little bit different than a potato chip or a tortilla chip. And it gives consumers something that feels a little more substantial and some savory flavors that totally make sense as a pasta. We're also seeing, as I mentioned, Kind with the Healthy Grains. They have a new line of popped snack bites. That's another fun thing that you can do with snacks to make them still feel a little less indulgent, a little more fun, a little light and poppable. Um, so the grain companies that are popping some of these grains are now finding a, a wonderful outlet in some of these natural brands. This uh, Kind bar has uh, brown rice, oats, popped sorghum, amaranth, millet, quinoa, buckwheat. A nice way of blending all those grains to get a really interesting flavor profile and mouthfeel. And I am waiting with impatience for Julian's recipes to release these waffle thins. They were on view and tasting uh, at both Expo West and here at the Fancy Food Show uh, here in New York. And this is a wonderful little cracker that uh, has a whole different kind of feel. Again, it's a little more like a cracker, but they have both sweet and savory flavors, and there are these little mini waffle crisps that also just lend themselves really well to savory flavors like the cheddar and parmesan and the olive oil.
And then we all know that the snack aisle has really expanded uh, lots of fun forms. I'm going to use pretzels as just one way to show all the different things that are happening with some of these grain-based snacks um, to really play with some of the grains, not just the, the type of grain, but also the format. And so we see these dream pretzels has the pretzels, which is a fun little skinny crisp bite that's treated like a bagel. Snyder's itself uh, has definitely been doing and having some fun with pretzels, with puffs, with nibbles, with stuffed pretzels, with gluten-free pretzels. Also, there's a lot of sourdough pretzels. And then on the gluten-free side, natural brands like Quinn uh, using sorghum in a gluten-free pretzel with a, a farm-to-bag claim. Uh, and they talk about where the sorghum was grown on the back of the bag. So here you see a company really pointing out that the grain is a big part of the story here. It's an ancient grain, non-GMO ingredient, it's whole, as well as naturally gluten-free. It's a really nice example. And then some more of the puffed and popped. We know popcorn has been a huge trend for a while, and popcorn is has some wonderful nutritionals that we tend to forget about, but that uh, dietary guidelines remind us that popcorn has a lot of good stuff going on, wonderful fiber, a great flavor, and eminently flavorable. We also are seeing some of the puffed grains do new things for some of these really interesting savory snacks that are appearing. The Chat Company is a San Francisco, uh, New York-based uh, Indian snack manufacturer that's making a savory yogurt, and you can see those are lentil puffs in a little cup at the top of the yogurt, and you add that in, mix it in, and the yogurts have Indian leaning savory flavors like cucumber mint. There's also a, a date and a carrot one. These are some really interesting snacks that eat like a snack yogurt, but the puffs really add a nice texture com component. The same thing is happening with this Evoke. It's a spoonable avocado puree with puffed quinoa that you can add in to add uh, interest and variety to the bite. And here's the iHeart quinoa, quinoa puffs that we are seeing. This is a company that started with a really dense quinoa bar, kind of tooth breakingly dense, and they have moved on to something a little puffier and yet still fun and with all that wonderful gluten-free protein that we like to get from quinoa. And of course, sweet snacks continue to cover the spectrum of some of these different uh, elements and ways that we like to snack right now. Uh, we certainly are seeing a lot of thinner cookies and crisps, certainly a way of making it both more munchable but also uh, a little less indulgent, uh, also lends itself well to gluten-free. And here you see how biscotti with these thin addictives, this is just one example of the many, many different brands now that are basically uh, types of bread studded with nuts and seeds that are super thinly sliced and then toasted for another way of sort of snacking on grain. Uh, bon Appetit recently had an interesting sablé cookie, that's a butter cookie recipe with toasted flour. Again, a different way of reinforcing and uh, accenting the flavor of the flour. And then we're also seeing a lot of baked goods. Some of our favorite things like donuts, waffles, funnel, funnel cakes are being turned into ice cream sandwiches. These seem a little bit away from the grain story, uh, but we are seeing some really interesting different ways uh, that these grain items are being expressed in a sweet space. Our last trend is going against the grain, and this is certainly something uh, that has continued to defy everybody's notions that gluten-free is a fad. Uh, this is just something that's now part of the landscape. I don't believe it's going to stay as, uh, as growth, as big of a growth area as it has been, but I do think it has a place now in uh, the marketplace. We see that PackageFax estimates that the market is going to hit 2.3 billion by 2019, so that's definitely still growing. But what we're seeing now, it's starting to evolve and expand in new directions. Uh, we're seeing growth in places like the pasta aisle, cold cereal aisle, baking mixes, and frozen bread dough. Just one example in the pasta space, are this is a really neat example of the bean-based or lentil, different kinds of pulses are being used for pasta, which maybe started off as a gluten-free alternative, but have now really shown that they have a place because there's a lot more nutrition. Uh, look at this 13 grams of fiber, 25 grams of protein in this pasta, which is pretty remarkable, and semolina really can't touch that. We're also seeing some interesting gluten-free 
flour blends, and this again is an evolution of, it's not just one size fits all uh, gluten free flour, we're starting to see these blends by specific use, which makes a lot more sense. So this is the specialization of this gluten free space. And then we continue to see companies like this European Char bringing its artisan bread line with more ancient grains. So again, getting more interesting and probably something that's going to appeal to not only a gluten-free diet person, but almost anyone looking for some of these terrific grains in their diet. We're also seeing uh, a lot of these uh, ancient grains are finding a space in the gluten-free space, like this pop sorghum, which is uh, pretty much is an ingredient supplier and they have a variety of different things that they're offering and this is the company that's selling the sorghum to Quinn to make the pretzels. We're also seeing the Perig has a continue, continually expanding line of ancient grain and gluten-free flours like the buckwheat flour, the farro flour, these are certainly something new. And then even thinking about buckwheat having new life in our very popular Asian space with soba noodles and some of these very traditional foods, I think we'll be seeing kasha coming from Eastern Europe. Um, with our interest in traditional foods, buckwheat definitely has a role as do many of these flowers and you see them come up both on the food service side as well as on the CPG side. What we're also seeing is how glamorous gluten-free is getting and inclusive. Uh, I was in Paris recently and delighted to go to not one, not two, but three or four different upscale gluten-free pastry shops. Of course, leave it to the French to make gluten-free glamorous. Um, I'm waiting for this shop to come here to the United States. This is a picture of the pastry case from Helmet New Cake. Um, certainly doing some really innovative things with gluten-free doughs. We also just saw this year this uh, glossy journal, GFF. This was a gluten-free journal by a San Francisco-based food writer that was recently purchased and is now being distributed by Meredith Publication. They publish Better Homes and Gardens among any number of other women's magazines. So this now has national distribution. And you can see this isn't that kind of health food, um, sort of crunchy granola, sort of niche health uh, side of gluten-free that we've seen before, but more of a big, delicious lifestyle. We're also seeing restaurants like this Little Gem restaurant, which opened up in San Francisco last year by people who used to work for Thomas Keller, really focusing on delicious, clean eating that also is allergy-free, tends to work for paleo folks, um, and also just appeals to a much broader set. And where we really see uh, gluten-free going is more towards the allergy-free side. Uh, we know that Mondelez recently purchased Enjoy Life Foods, which continues to release a lot of really terrific and very thoughtful products, both snacks, baking mixes, um, into the marketplace. And that company estimates that there are 100 million people in the U.S., including gluten-free folks, but 75 mil million others who are shopping free from for a whole variety of reasons. Of course, if there's a one gluten-free user in a family, typically there are a, um, the whole family often buys some of these products. So we're seeing the sales of allergen-free products rose 26.5% in both conventional and natural channels uh, in the last year to hit almost uh, $200 million. And we continue to see the gluten-free sales grow and we see grain-free also growing in a greater rate. So that's what's really interesting. The gluten-free kind of slowing in a growth side, but the grain-free even starting from a small space, but with some significant growth. And you see here on the left-hand side, the Tastry is a company that has all allergy-free products that it will connect to allergy-free uh, sufferers who are looking for safe food for themselves and their families. And we're also seeing these grainless products grow. Uh, at first glance, many of these products seem paleo, but they also uh, work for a lot of different people. And so this is where innovation gets really interesting. Um, they, the people who are trying to try out new ways are, are very creative, and sometimes they actually find delicious foods that anybody would like. The almond flour tortillas you see here from Siete Foods are an example of this. The company also has a cassava root tortilla, uh, and these are very nice, supple, good-tasting alternatives. The paleo wraps are made from coconut, so here you have a coconut wrapper that could easily uh, work doesn't have to be paleo. It could work well in a Southeast Asian type of meal or just anyone trying to reduce their carbohydrates. 
The Capellas is a fettuccine, gnocchi, lasagna. They also have cookie dough and pizza crust made from almond flour. And we're seeing companies like Simple Mills, and uh, here you have Bob's Red Mill just came out with a paleo mix that's made with almond flour and coconut flour. Uh, also cauliflower standing in for grains in the um, absolutely gluten-free cauliflower crust pizza. This is a big home thing. A lot of consumers at home are swapping recipes and using cauliflower instead of rice, uh, instead of other kinds of grains to give a kind of grain experience. And the wild wing is just one example of a number of grain-free cereals that are using nuts and seeds um, to get away from grains but still provide a grain-like experience. And here's a quick uh, sliver of some of the products that I saw yesterday at the show, including the Perry Company, which is doing a really good job of bringing uh, ingredients like teff. This is a line of teff porridges in different flavors. And they also have a line of the frika, which is an ancient wheat being used as uh, side dishes and bases. The Back to the Roots people have a strung ground flake cereal that's made from biodynamic wheat. This is a beyond organic way of agriculture that um, is not is being used very readily in Europe or much more it's much more common in Europe. It's very often used for wine grapes, and now we're seeing a biodynamically grown wheat turned into a cereal. Here's some new quinoa puffs coming from South America. You'll see the uh, Julian's waffle, this Belgian waffle that has muesli added to it for interest. Uh, the Feel Good Dough is an organic dough being used for pizza dough. And this company was very excited to tell me that um, Red Star is now making an organic yeast. And they're one of the only companies that has it now, which is going to change the organic labeling on bread. And then here's another grain, a grainless granola. I'm going to close with a handful of some strategic inspirations here and how you can leverage some of these trends, and then we'll be taking your questions. So feel free to send those in if you haven't already. Uh, so obviously some ideas, leveraging whole grains for energy and satiety foods. These continue to be consumer demands. Uh, how can you use different kinds of heritage, wheat, heritage wheats and grains to answer those needs? Again, look for places in your portfolio or different ways to talk about and use sprouted grains. They just make so much sense, and uh, consumers are really understanding it more and more in a variety of foods. I think the, con the convenience grain blends, these are really hard to cook at home. It's hard to make a blend uh, from scratch, and this is where a convenience value added a product really is welcomed by consumers. So whether it's something from the freezer case or something that's par-cooked on the shelf, or even in a retort pouch, uh, these types of grains really do give a lot back to the consumer looking for uh, an interesting side dish uh, or any kind of grain product. Also think about different ways you can use grain bowls uh, throughout the day, whether it's a morning bowl, whether it's a savory morning bowl, or some kind of lunch or even a snack. We really are seeing these come out in both food service and CPG in a lot of different ways, and it really fits the millennial mandate for uh, exploration as well as variability. I think now is a great time to start working on some flavorful flour blends to be used in cookies and muffins, coffee cakes, even brownies, as well as other kinds of baked goods, waffles, pancakes. Um, we already see these more in a gluten-free space or just in a health space, but I think there's a big opportunity to leverage this from a flavor side, a flavor point of view. Thinking about the local grain producers, there's a lot going on here, uh, and it's really an exciting moment. Um, this is not all figured out yet. Obviously, a lot of these grains are being grown somewhat experimentally, and they're still subject to a lot of the variability that comes from small-scale agricultural production, as well as using heritage grains that maybe nobody's been using for a while. Uh, but I think there's a neat opportunity to tap into consumer interest for this type of variety and this kind of um, connectedness in our food supply. Also look for new ways of adding nutritious whole grains or ancient grains to breakfast and snack foods. You've seen just a small sliver here today. Uh, there's a lot of space and with all the different types of grains available, there really um, there's plenty for innovation's sake. And then think about what brands or where does it make sense to tap into some of the allergy-free or grain-free options 
um, whether it's on college campuses, whether it's uh, for families and kids, think of different ways that you can tap into this growing concern. I'm now going to end this presentation and I'm going to turn it over to David Sprinkle to moderate our Q&A session. Thank you very much for uh, your interest and participation today. Thank you, Kira, for that very comprehensive um, survey of the innovation. And we do have a couple of questions um, from the audience. One is um, something that you touched on um, somewhat with the gluten-free and the um, glamorous pastries and even the, the, the flavor of the flower blends for flavor. But um, especially now with millennials, is some sort of health or nutritional note almost, um, almost mandatory now? even for stock goods and indulgent goods, or is there still pretty much a space there always has been for sheerly indulgent products or fads like the cronut or the variations on the cupcake? Well, there's always going to be a space for an artisan donut, a fun cronut. Um, those, that's always uh, something that we have a little corner of our diet reserved for. So not every indulgent food needs to solve for nutrition. But I think what is interesting is that uh, we can add a nutritional element as well as uh, an element of authenticity, uh, an element of um, variety and flavor to a lot of these indulgent goods and bring them a little bit over um, out of the indulgent space and make them more acceptable, more interesting, more times of the day. And, and we can use those grains to tone down the indulgence a little bit and make us feel good. But I still think there's always going to be room for the super healthy, for the allergy-free item, for the gluten-free item, all the analogs of all of our favorite baked goods, as well as something that's just kind of hardcore delicious. But I think what we're going to find, especially with those flavor flowers and that notion of using flowers to add interesting flavor, uh, is that we're going to be able to make even more delicious and tasty and interesting indulgent baked goods and treats. Okay, and um, another question about those, um, especially flowers that, that you're talking about, asking how much of that is being produced by small specialty mills, and will those small mills be able to keep up with the demand of a larger producer using their product? And this is an excellent question, and it's certainly something that I am um, thinking about as we talk about this trend. I think um, what is challenging for large companies is this is not to scale yet. Um, these types of tapping into these local grains, they are still very small. They are um, subject to some of the you know, agricultural ups and downs that farmers used to have problems with. Uh, but I think there are ways of looking at limited edition products at partnering with some of these people to help them or support them uh, getting and growing larger. We do see uh, right now the uh, professor that is running the bread lab at Washington State University has been working with Chipotle Mexican Grill to create a certain kind of grain and grow and have that grain grown to be used in flour tortillas at Chipotle. And this is exactly the issue that is being looked at and trying to, you know, trying to grapple with. If this grain is grown and all of it goes to Chipotle, will there be any left for the little guys? Um, that's a big question. Right now the answer is yes. Um, this was covered in an article last October in the New York Times Magazine, uh, a feature about the bread lab. And so this, uh, but we, we have to always start somewhere and uh, start small. And I think what's exciting for the big manufacturers is that there are opportunities to create premium brands and niche brands uh, and even spell out to consumers that you may not get these all the time. This is going to be a special limited run. And after that, you know, there may be another version of this product with a different grain. Obviously, this needs to get planned in advance. Um, but I think you're going to see that just like we see with some of these distilleries and these very boutique-y spirits where they only have a limited edition, it has really driven up the price and driven up the interest. Um, I also think that our larger producers are already working on using some of these grains and tapping into them. 
so I do think we're going to be seeing more variety and more options from our millers and our larger grain producers, but we do you know, want to try and keep a cap on them. The idea is to not you know, turn them into a mass product uh, and keep them on a smaller scale so we can continue to have those benefits. So, you know, it's not, the idea is not to, to tap into this and, and use it to make, you know, Anheuser-Busch Budweiser beer. The, the idea is to, you know, to try and support and grow and the consumers who are interested in this will understand that there is a variability and a limit, at least for the time being. Okay, another question. Um, I, you talked about biodynamic and gave some details on that, but anything more on that? on that tradition, which you described as more common in Europe, and on how that differs from organic. Right. So this, what is so exciting and really interesting about biodynamics, um, a number of years ago I worked at Copia, the American Center for Wine, Food, and the Arts, which was a food and wine cultural center based in Napa, the town of Napa, and at the time we had 12 acres of biodynamic gardens. These were display gardens that were grown in accordance with the biodynamic principles, which were originally set forth by Rudolf Steiner, who's an uh, Austrian, I believe, uh, and these came out in the 1920s and 30s. This is also the person who founded the Waldorf School, so sort of a very alternative thinker who laid out a very traditional way of planting and growing crops that followed moon phases, that used natural fertilizers made from compost, and also had some dictates about basically treating the soil and feeding the soil and how that nutrition comes from sort of the whole universe. This is where it starts getting a little out there. And that energy is harnessed and put into the plants and made in a very beyond organic way. So right now we occasionally see products called beyond organic and that's often what they're talking about. The biodynamic principles can seem a little out there. Um, but it is something, again, in Europe where the food industry perhaps had a different kind of impact uh, and that people remained um, closer to the land and farming in a smaller scale way for longer so that biodynamic tradition and certainly the way of growing grapes um, isn't as foreign or bizarre. Um, what's interesting about the biodynamics is, again, this is an organic practice, so there are no traditional pesticides, there are no traditional uh, fertilizers uh, used as input. This is a very kind of pre-food industry way of growing things and as we see many people interested in returning to that type of thing, I think we're going to continue to see some growth in biodynamics um, as well as, you know, as we continue to grapple with also our organic uh, agricultural practices and the non-GMO project or the non-GMO interest in the labeling um, is just another indicator of people wanting to understand where their food comes from and being in, interested in using less pesticides uh, uh, in their food or at least knowing when it is present. Okay, and let me, let me ask as a, as a final question and looking back at the work done with culinary trend mapping, the classical pattern, you are going from fine dining or certainly fresh foods, fresh foods culinary, culinary tradition, tradition um, into, packaged, into foods. Into packaged foods. But it seems like with grain, this is very much a two-way street in terms of innovation, where there's room for fresh foods for restaurants to learn from packaged foods and vice versa. Is that fair to say that this is sort of a somewhat unique pattern of innovation, at least compared with the historical classical pattern? I think what has happened to that pattern, and you know, you're talking about the, the sort of the trend tracking where very often many culinary trends are coming from the fine dining space, trickle into specialty food, and move up into mainstream from there. What has changed in the last number of years is the rise of the natural channel and the natural products industry that's feeding that channel. And so what we're seeing is both from the culinary, and the culinary when you think about new cooking methods, global foods, different kinds of flavors and spices, kind of that, um, kind of a, a different sort of space versus the health side and products that are being created for certain health reasons. And gluten-free is a great example. 
gluten-free trend didn't really come out of the fine dining space. It maybe came out of a niche health space or a health food store space. So you're really seeing that these now exist in a side-by-side -side space. These are parallel tracks of growth. And so what you're, you are seeing are trends that are coming from this natural space, like the grain-free trend, then being picked up and use a little more broadly in the food service space. So whether we start seeing more grain-free granolas or different kinds of grain-free grain products in food service, it's coming and being influenced by the health space. So what's exciting about now uh, and innovation is our, how this nutrition space and kind of thinking about nutrition and wellness has really impacted how we eat all the time, both when we're just thinking about flavor and perhaps flavor adventure or sensory side, as well as thinking about our health. And going back to what you said earlier about millennials really being interested in healthy foods, um, this is where there's a really cool overlap and opportunities to leverage both sides of kind of that culinary spectrum as well as the health spectrum. Um, so I think we're seeing some nice exchanges and uh, it's, it's exciting and just gives a lot of opportunity to manufacturers and to food service people to play with some of these items and really expand our choice set. Okay, Kira, thank you very much as always for your insights. Thank you to our listeners for joining us. And again, you will be getting an email with follow-up with um, um, information about how to download the session and also follow-up with any additional questions. Thank you all.